evening, Honorable Prime Minister, distinguished guests, and um, I'm really honored to be asked to deliver the Edgar Little Holzer Lecture this year. Um, I was delighted to meet Dr. Rose in Cuba when he asked me to, to, to give the Edgar Little Holzer Lecture, so I was very thrilled about that. And the title of this lecture is Guyanese Literature, Magic Realism, and the South American Connection. Now about 30 years ago, maybe even 40 years ago, I was in the National Museum of Guyana, and I noticed one feature that was probably unique in museums around the world. Possibly our museum is the only one that has done this. Amidst all the historical and technological, archaeological, geological specimens that were on display in the museum, um, samples of native jasper, implements used in the slave trade, bottles from ships bringing indentured laborers, Amerindian feathered headdresses, all these artifacts that trace the changes, arrivals, and developments in uh, Guyanese history, amidst all this, there, there existed a carefully cordoned off, mysteriously empty space. And this space was specifically set aside for the nation's spirits, ghosts, and zombies. And I thought to myself at the time, what other national museum in the whole world has been considerate enough to leave a space for its ghosts, a place for the enigmatic other? Now, unsurprisingly, the space has always remained empty. Well, I don't know what happens late at night when the museum is shut, but when I've been there, it's remained empty. The spirits declined to show up. Now, 30 odd years ago, that space consisted of a small plinth covered in plush red fabric, partitioned off with gold tasseled ropes, as if the spirits were a secret royalty of Guyana. On the back wall hung separate plaques with detailed sociological descriptions of each spirit, itemizing its habitat, appearance, customary behavior, and even dietary preferences. Baku apparently likes to eat bananas and milk. Moongazer straddles the crossroads. Dutchman patrols the boundaries of his plantations and likes his bones to be properly buried. And in that descriptive labeling, we see the attempt of the rational with its orderly classifications and categorizations to contain or even overpower the magical. And I was very caught by the uneasy coexistence of post-enlightenment social sciences and ancient supernatural beliefs, the tension between rationalism and imagination. Now recently, I was back in the museum maybe two or three years ago, and the space has become less prominent and more functional. It has shrunk. The gold tassel ropes have gone, as if rationalism itself was trying to push such a space out of the way and diminish it. And this would be a shame because it's one of the areas where the imagination of Guyanese writers can reside. Now, this lecture is going to concentrate on some of the specifically South American elements in Guyanese fiction and then look at the literary movement of magic realism that spread through Latin America in the second half of the 20th century and to look at that movement and see whether or not it has affected Guyanese writing. Now for Guyanese literature to be studied in the context of South America is unusual. The imposition of the English language on all the various peoples of Guyana means that we're more accustomed to studying and analyzing our literature in terms of the Anglophone tradition and influences, whether they be European, North American, or Caribbean, or we might look back to Africa or the Indian subcontinent or China for inspiration. The tendency is for the majority of the population living on the coast to look outward 
across the sea rather than to look over their shoulder and compare their literature with the writings and mythologies from the vast continent behind them. However, one of the first and abiding features that marks Guyana out as a continental rather than an island environment is the landscape. Now, in common with the rest of South America, Guyana has one of the great primary landscapes of the world. Rainforests, savannas, mountains, ancient swamplands, and huge, enormous, uh, gigantic rivers. Now, you don't find these in the islands. And I wanted for once, just for a change, for us to start to place ourselves as part of a South American people, as well as the Anglophone Caribbean. Um, and of course, Guyanese literature contains influence related to the landscape and to its original inhabitants. Uh, it's necessary to consider South America at a time before it was divided into colonies by the European powers, and to think of the land without those historical impositions before colonialism, before nationalism, and all the other isms. And there's a relevant passage in the work of the Chilean poet Pablo Neruda, who writes from the other side of the continent. Uh, in his poem, Demasiados Nombres, Too Many Names, Neruda complains about the division of the continent into separate countries and takes us back to prehistory. Uh, I'm quoting here, he says in that poem, they have spoken to me of Venezuelas, of Chiles, of Paraguays. I have no idea what they are saying. I know only the skin of the earth and I know it has no name. The skin of the earth, this vast primordial landscape, pervades the consciousness of most Guyanese writers. Even coastlanders whose experience is more confined uh, to urban settings, they're aware of the elemental forces of the hinterland encroaching upon them. And poets are always traditionally close to nature. And Guyanese poets are no exception. They share this closeness to nature with poets from the rest of South America, such as Pablo Neruda, or the Peruvian poet Cesar Vallejo. And just to pick one or two Guyanese examples at random, we have uh, Arthur Seymour's Kai, his poetic legend of Kaichua Falls, Ian MacDonald, who we're honored to have here uh, this evening. His work is steeped in the Guyanese landscape, as is the work of Mark McWatt. Martin Carter, possibly the greatest of Guyanese poets, produced work that was elliptical, metaphysical, and political, but he never forgot the difference in scale between a breathtaking primeval landscape and its relatively insignificant human inhabitants. In one of his later poems, Martin expresses this positioning of human beings somewhere between the insects and the forest. To quote him, he says, here is where I am, in a great geometry between a raft of ants and the green site of the freedom of a tree. Now, in a continent where geography continually threatens to triumph over history, there is a story. Now, I've heard this. It might be apocryphal. I don't know if it's true. It's about Martin's last words. On his deathbed, combining his usual humor, gravitas, and possibly prophecy, he is supposed to have said, Swamp wanty land back. As if the whole of the human endeavor would eventually be swallowed up by the elemental forces of nature surrounding us. Indeed, awareness of this hinterland seems to have produced a particularly metaphysical cast of mind in Guyanese writers such as Carter and Wilson Harris. And it's not only the poets. Guyanese novelists also make effective use of the physical landscape and the interior. Wilson Harris's novel Heartland, for instance, opens with a magnificent, magnificent description of daybreak in one of Guyana's great rivers. Edgar Mittelhotzer himself, in whose honor this lecture is given, um, frequently depicted the bush as sinister and threatening, particularly in his novel, which Alim mentioned earlier, My Bones and My Flute. 
and in relation to the forces of nature, Mittelholzer himself indicated that climate and weather were always among the main protagonists of his work. Climate and heat, violent tropical storms provided atmosphere and often a metaphor for the extremism in his novels. One of his books is even called The Weather Family. Yet however poetic these descriptions of nature may be, they still belong to a strand of realism in Guyanese literature. And to understand some of the metaphysical or supernatural elements in Guyanese narrative, I wanted to look at the pre-Columbian history of the continent, which is often ignored by literary critics and scholars. Now, according to Dr. Adim Ishmael, the first traces of Amerindian existence in South America are 11,000 years old. And throughout that period, from the beginning to the present day, there have been innumerable indigenous peoples and languages whose customs and myths have been passed down, apart from petroglyphs, but mainly through the oral tradition. And it's fascinating to see how these influences reappear in Guyanese literature. I mean, of course, there are the place names that we have existing in the Caribbean and South America. Demerara derives from the Arawak word Malali, meaning a fast running stream, and the Dutch called it Demalali, from which we get Demerara. Berbice is from the Arawak word Berbishi, which is a sort of banana. And the name Cuba, the island of Cuba, comes from the Arawak word taku 